Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I love the season of Lent and Easter. I love the, the special services that we have, uh, whether it's during Holy Week or, or the midweek services. I love this, the special music, the Lenten hymns that, that lead into the, the Easter hymns. It's actually a lot like Advent and Christmas. Well, we've got the special services, you've got this season of anticipation leading up to the big moment where the really great songs are. But I think one area that Easter really gets robbed is movies. You know, as we're preparing for, for Christmas and, you know, in the church, we're in the season of Advent, but we can have all of these movies, whether it's ones that have religious themes to them or, or just the secular Christmas movies that, that help us get into uh, the, the mood. And, and Easter doesn't really have quite as many. But as I was, I was thinking about Easter, or Christmas movies, I, I thought about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And you might re remember in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, there, there was the Island of Misfit Toys. The, these toys that didn't really turn out so well. Uh, there was a jack-in-the-box named Charlie. There was a spotted elephant. A choo-choo train with, with square wheels on its caboose. A, a water pistol that kind of morbidly appearing shoots jelly. Uh, and then a cowboy who rides an ostrich, this, this weird collection of misfits. And as I thought about that, I thought it's kind of fitting, thinking about that during one of these holy seasons, because you know what? God comes for misfits. That's what Easter is all about. God loves misfits. I'm a misfit. You're a misfit. We all, we're all misfits. We all fall short of God's will and God's ways. But fellow misfits, God comes for you, just like he has come for others. Think about it. Look at some of the misfits that God has come for. Peter, not only is he slower than John in getting to the tomb, but he denied Jesus three times. Paul. We love to read Paul's letters in the New Testament. But there was a time when Paul was a religious thug and a severe persecutor of the Christian church. Or we can jump back to the Old Testament. What about King David? Womanizer. Bloodthirsty. Get repentant. Today, on this Resurrection Day, we add another person to this list of misfits. Mary. Mary Magdalene. All throughout Lent on, the, on Sundays and in Holy Week, we, we have been going through this sermon series called Witnesses to Christ, and we've been looking at various people throughout the Passion narrative. And today we look at Mary. Mary begins as a mess. In Luke chapter 8, we read Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Now there are five Marys in the New Testament which is why this one is identified uh, with Magdalene. Now, Magdalene isn't her last name. It actually refers to her hometown, a little fishing village on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee called Magdala. Luke tells us that Mary had been demon-possessed with seven demons. It's actually the biblical number for completeness or a complete set. Can you imagine being that messed up? Perhaps. Here's how it might happen with us. There's a compulsion to prove. We begin a job or a task or a class with high hopes and high endeavor. I'll show them I'll be the best. There's intensity. We arrive early. We stay late. We give it all we've got. And there's subtle deprivations. To keep going, we begin to deprive ourselves. Maybe we stop exercising. Stop getting enough sleep. Stop reading our Bible or attending church. We pick up bad eating habits. More donuts will probably do the trick. We, we begin to have distorted thinking. We, we tell ourselves things will get better after I finish this project. I'll get back on track with my family life after tax season or after this business trip. 
and there's heightened denial. People close to us begin to see what we can't see. We have less joy in a hobby or in a sport or in life in general. We're often tired. We begin to watch too much TV or just check out. There's disengagement. Life becomes a checklist of things to do. One thing after another, we live in order for vacation. But vacation, it never lasts long enough. Then there can begin to be behavioral changes, observable behavioral changes. People who might not even know us can see that something is wrong. Our survival strategies become unhealthy. Too much internet, too much eating, too much sleeping, too much shopping, too much caffeine, too much whatever. Depersonalization. We become robotic. We just go through the motions. We play the part. We put on a face. But we've got nothing left in the tank. We hit rock bottom. We internalize everything. We talk to no one and we feel as though we've got at least seven demons going on inside of us. We can all get in a bit of a mess like Mary. We can all get down, depressed, and hit rock bottom. Did, did you know that 20% of the people who are on disability are on it because of severe depression? Did you know that despite being the richest nation on earth, the United States, according to the World Health Organization, is also the most depressed nation on earth? Did you know that in the last decade, depression among American teenagers has increased 200%? And that's not even counting what has taken place over the last two years. We can all get down. Mary was down. But her Messiah had lifted her up. Jesus lifted Mary up from her pit of seven, seven demons. That's why Mary Magdalene follows Jesus all the way to the cross to watch her Savior bleed and die. Mary's Messiah is your Messiah. His face is caked with spit and blood. His throat is so dry he can't swallow. His voice is so hoarse he can barely speak. To find the last time that moisture had touched his lips, we need to rewind the clock 12 hours to the meal in the upper room. Since drinking the Passover cup, Jesus has been betrayed, condemned, mocked, beaten, and crucified. No liquid has quenched his thirst since then. That's how things stand just before dawn on Sunday. There had been so much hope, so much promise, but now it had all come to what? Nothing. Nothing. That, that, that famous rabbi, dead. His disciples, in hiding. Other followers, scattered. One, Judas Iscariot, even killed himself. Mary Magdalene gets up early on that Sunday morning to anoint Christ's dead body. But the body isn't in the tomb. Mary breaks out crying. She tells her story, first to Peter and John, and then to the two angels who are sitting in the tomb, and now, for a third time, to a man she thinks to be the gardener. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Mary. The voice is unmistakable. Mary. No one has ever said her name with such tenderness. Mary. She looks up and in sudden recognition cries out, Rabboni. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's not dead. He has risen from the grave. He's alive. Christ is alive. Emotions flood Mary's heart. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as she transitions from the depths of grief, despair, and sorrow to the heights of ecstasy and joy? Just when it appeared as though it was all over. To the shock and surprise of everyone, the Father raised Jesus bodily from the dead. 
this misfit Mary now experiences tremendous joy. And she shares that joy and good news with others. I have seen the Lord. Now, when, he, when she says Lord here, it's not just a, a polite way of talking about Jesus, like sir or, or mister. With Lord, Mary is saying, I have seen God, the king of the universe. I have seen the one through whom and for whom all things were made. I have seen the one who is coming again, riding on the clouds as the king of kings and lord of lords. That's also why, why Thomas's parallel confession, which we'll read next week, has these words, my Lord and my God. So what's it all mean? It means there's more to our lives than we might think. It means there's more to our story than what we can see with our eyes. It means that there's more than just death and taxes. Christ's resurrection means that just like Mary Magdalene, God has come for mystics, just like us. Now, it's interesting, last night as I was preparing for my sermon and I was looking up on the internet, uh, what, what the, you know, I remembered the Misfit Island of Misfit Toys, but I didn't remember any of the specific toys, so I thought I'd like to be able to list some of them. So I, I was doing a little internetting, and, and I came across some controversy. Did you know that there's controversy about the end of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? There are all sorts of crazy theories, and I'd love to share them with you, but first of all, it has nothing to do with the sermon. Uh, but also, I didn't finish reading all of them because it was getting late. But, but there's something about, in the original version, whether or not Santa even came back for the mystic toys. There's one theory that in the original version, Santa picks up the misfit toys, but then you see them just tossing them out of the sleigh in boxes that, no, he's not delivering those toys. He's getting rid of those mistakes. And then in a re-edit, they, they hand all the misfit toys umbrellas as they're handed out of the, the sleigh so they can at least make it gently down to earth. But they're in the Arctic Ocean, so they're just landing. And the bird that couldn't fly but could swim, he doesn't get an umbrella. He's just tossed out of the sleigh. Now, as I thought about that, and again, it was getting late, and I was trying to wrap my mind around all, like, I had so much uncertainty about this story. It made me glad that there is no uncertainty about this story. There is no uncertainty about whether or not Jesus has come back for us. We know he has. Christ was raised from the dead. He came back for you. He came back for me. He, he doesn't abandon us. He, he doesn't toss us overboard when it gets inconvenient or too much or just done one too many things. No, he holds us. He keeps us. Now and always. That is our Easter hope and promise. Amen. And now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.